there is, in the sigh of space between the seasons, a sparkling silence that hangs like mist. And then, there is a bell. It rings only once, at the exact midpoint between one season and the next, the exact moment of transition. It can sound like laughter, or settling sea foam, or the crackle of campfire, or the sprinkling of snow, and there are very few who are able to hear it. Only those who know how to listen to the songs of the earth, this planet of intangible mystery. Only people like you. You have come to know the sound of the bell, like the song of your own heart. After all, it wakes you once each year, on a crisp and quiet night between the sunset and the dawn. It's your call to adventure. For three of the Earth's seasons, you sleep blissfully, cloaked in cool mosses and undergrowth. Like butterflies enclose themselves within the chrysalis, transforming unseen through the alchemy of sleep. You wrap yourself in a sugar-spun blanket and await the hour. In the safety of your cocoon, you restore, refresh, and ready for the next spin you'll take about the earth. Your wings, which tatter and tire over the course of your seasonal movements, are rejuvenated within. Your body strengthens. The world turns outside your shell, nourishing seeds, sending up flowers and budding the branches. But a universe of change is occurring within, beneath sleep's regenerative enchantment. And in the spell of a moment, in the echo of the ring of a bell, sleep's charm is lifted. You emerge from your nest, stretch your arms to the pearly moon, and try your wings for the first time in many months. They unfold with the sensation of a long-held sigh, translucent and iridescent in the night's gleam. Your skin and wings reflect the shimmering moonlight, so you seem innately effulgent. How satisfying it is to unfurl, like the petals of a night-blooming flower, and re-emerge into the world. Like a patchwork quilt across the forest floor lie layers of crisp fallen leaves. They crackle in response to even your tiniest movements, a rippling percussion. Overhead are the branches they once called home, now bare and delicate like bones making puzzles across the deep blue of the midnight sky. Stars seem to hang like baubles on the trees, blinking brightly. Not far off, there is movement twixt the trees, and shining light in shades that shift between crimson, auburn, and gold. You lift an arm to wave to the bouncing orb, your autumnal cousin, having overseen the last leaves fall, the final breath of her season. 
She waves back as she retires for her time of rest. Her wings are withered and eyelids heavy as she floats downward to the forest floor. It's only at this tender moment, this passing pause at the end of one season and the start of another, that you cross paths with the fall fairy, so you cherish the fleeting sight of her all the more. That there is little time to spend in greetings or catchings up. The bell has rung, and the whole world awaits your gentle touch. With discerning hand, you shall take to flight, bringing the first frost over your territories. The last harvest lies behind, and the shortest day ahead. Now is a time of lengthening darkness and deepening chill, of hibernation and withdrawal. Now is the time for carrion birds to inherit the earth and for evergreen trees to prove their mettle. These are beautiful things. The tools of your trade are few, in fact, singular. A wand fashioned anew each year from the very essence of frost. With your feet light on the ground, toes in the cold topsoil, you close your eyes and summon a suite of images to your mind. Fractal patterns, tessellated panes, a spectrum of colors blooming from the dazzle of sunlight on glass. I see blues, wintry pinks, pale greens, and deep violets. Snow-laden branches ready to snap. Snowflakes melting on black eyelashes. White skies. Frozen lakes. Frost-covered window panes. A pleasing shiver runs down your spine and the first inkling of winter magic swells within your chest, trickling like water down your arms and into your fingertips. You open your eyes, place the tips of your forefingers and thumbs together, and begin to pull your hands apart, meeting unseen resistance. In the space now between your hands, gathered up from your frosty intentions, there crystallizes a slender cylinder, a wand. You grasp it, twinkling, and hold it to the light of the moon to admire your handiwork. Delicate spirals cascade down its shaft and it is tipped with the likeness of an intricate snowflake. To test its capabilities, you lower the wand to the layer of curled, dead leaves at your feet. With only the slightest touch of the wand to the brown edge of a single leaf, there plumes a dusting of sparkling frost. It spreads like a sprinkling of powdered sugar across the forest floor in only seconds, and where once there was the activity of decay, 
Now there is a shining sheen, a moment in time preserved. With your new wand in hand and your wings at last warmed, you kick off from the ground and begin your first flight of the season. A trail of shimmering frost follows your movement like an afterglow. It feels good to fly again after so long confined, and you tumble and roll through the endless space with an outpouring of energy and joy. You touch your wand to the tresses of pine and cedar, letting a kiss of frost accumulate upon the needles of midnight green. You sweetly frost the petals of a cluster of witch's thimble, turning the bell-shaped blooms to frozen lavender statuary. There's a shallow lake at the edge of the wood and you flutter toward it on a gust of night breeze. Gently you drift down toward it till your tiny feet just skim the surface where you meet the water, wand trailing behind you, spirals of sparkling frost trace themselves like feathers forward and back. You skate freely, breezing the ripples and wakes as you go. To the last of the dandelions, rounded with fuzzy seeds swaying under your wings, you bestow glittering ice crystals so they become tiny mirror balls on the forest floor. With the woods all a sparkle, you venture onward into the open air, where the moonlight, unhindered by latticed branches and evergreen boughs, shines all the brighter. In its beams, you are illuminated and opalescent, changing color and character on the night. In a garden, past holly hedge and archway, you harden the soil. Your work is important. This task of turning the earth cold so that it may sleep, restore itself. But there is a bitter sweetness to it. Those glorious flowers that persist through spring's promise and summer's heat to reach the calm of autumn. To them, you utter thanks and blessings. To the moon flowers on the vine, you incline your head and admire how they reflect the beauty of their namesake. Then, with a glisten of ice, they fold in on themselves, trumpets diminish. To an abundant hedge of wine-red dahlias, you sigh and wish peace. These you touch ever so lightly with the tip of your wand, watching as for one blissful moment, they take on a fine coating of frost, which only enhances their beauty. And an instant later, their buoyant heads droop and petals wither, weighed down to the earth. This is the nature of the season and mournful though it may be 
to kiss the flowers goodbye. Their very impermanence is essential to their beauty. Would we love the flowers as much if they bloomed from January to January? Or do we cherish them so much more, drink deeper of their glory because they raise their heads in the moments we need them most before moving on in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth? some blooming for whole months or seasons and others like the moonflower for a single wondrous day certainly you've entertained some envy for your cousin the spring fairy who has the privilege of waking the flowers after a long winter's sleep and for the summer fairy who brings them to full bloom setting whole hillsides aflame with poppies and blue bonnets you take solace in your role as the flowers mediator though bestower of blessings and good wishes for the journey back to the soil you are honored to be the one who sees them in their final moments of splendor, hovering just upon the threshold of another world. Now, as your feet freeze the soil, you seal in the seeds, the next generation, to germinate and rise again come spring. In the same soil, the decaying flowers will nourish those seeds. The light of the moon shines in on this garden, a humble hideaway. You'd like to stay, even among the dying flowers. This place is peaceful and clearly well-loved. But there is so much more to do. So you sprinkle icy dust over the holly hedges, breathe the thin layer of water in the fountain, and bid the lovely place good night. On you soar through the hours of night, across farms and fields and rivers. Your wing beats stir the air into swirls of chilly wind which ripple outward over the land. You land softly on a wooden window frame and peer inside to see a dog snoozing on a hearth rug and a woman seated in a rocking chair beside the fire knitting needles in hand you touch your wand to the corners of the window panes alighting crystals of ice and etching fog across the glass the amber glow of the fire flickers more vaguely beyond the frosted panes. You dance tiny gems of ice upon blades of grass, and you dapple the apple trees with frosty glaze. You float on moonlit wings through the spirals of night, whispering wind and leaves whipped up in your wake. With swiftness and grace, you adorn the earth with the first diamonds of winter. Spiked feathers of frost on the leaves, waters, rooftops, and soil. 
and the world spins beneath you and the moon travels down the sky seeming to increase in size as it nears the horizon. You blow kisses to the moon and they rise as clouds of misty, visible breath. The dawn is swiftly approaching. You can feel it drawing nearer like a warm tingle in your toes and on your shoulders. When the inhabitants of this world awake, they'll find their landscape dusted with faint, sparkling crystals, which will dwindle and fade before the sun makes its first sweep across the sky. Soon, you'll make your retreat for the day to store up your strength for the season ahead. But you've got one last trick up your sleeve for this first night of frost. It's something just for you and those few who passed this night in voracious reading or stayed up to watch the sunrise or toil the whole night through and now head home to sleep the day away. It's something for those of you who can hear the bell. The wide earth shrinks beneath you as you soar on gossamer wings, up, up, up in spirals toward the starry sky. Clouds are scudding peacefully by overhead, their underbellies soft and flocculent. One catches your eye so perfectly formed and pillowy above. To this exquisite cloud you float and gracefully extend your snowflake-tipped wand to touch its underside. A blue-white shiver comes over the cloud like a flash of electricity that disappears in a wave. With a tiny spark that energizes your whole tiny self, you can sympathetically feel the cloud's changing chemistry, unlocking its atoms and preparing it to open. When the first flake falls, it seems to do so in slow motion, drifting, whipped on invisible currents of air, falling up and down in a windward dance. More snowflakes begin to fall as the cloud releases its hold on them. You tap your wand to another cloud's rich underside, then another, until you've touched each one in sight to deliver a dainty flurry. Catching the wind, you balance on tiptoe on the thin cascading disc of a snowflake. This you ride down the sky, embracing all its unusual turns and tumbles, surrendering to the wintry ballet. All around you, the flakes bluster and fly, 
each one displaying a distinct pattern of spikes and branches, circles and fractals. They catch the waning moonlight and awaken little rainbows within themselves. But one by one, they are melting, too. This is only the first frost, after all, and the turn toward winter is not yet complete. You never intended these snowflakes to find the earth, but in their momentary dance, they are something. The flake beneath your feet slowly dissolves and your wings resume their duty to hold you up amid the softening snow. There will be blankets of white in the future, a whole landscape transformed by fresh feet of accumulation. There's a whole wondrous winter ahead. Tonight is only the beginning, only the first night of the season to reawaken your gifts and become acquainted with your new wand. The season is a journey, no matter when or how insistently the bell rings to welcome it. Like all things in nature, a season must be brought on slowly, softly, leaving little hints everywhere it goes. As the steward, the herald of winter, the frost, snow and ice, you are keenly aware of the distaste many have for your line of work, for your season. But like the earth, you understand the necessity and indeed the majesty of all her journeys. After long effort, there comes a need for sleep. After growth and flourishing and reaping, there comes a need, an ache for renewal. Renewal which is impossible without the sleep of winter. Under quilts of snow and sheets of ice, the frozen soil readies its gifts for new life. Behind warm walls, the hands that toiled all year can soften with the mild activity of celebration and care. In the midst of the cold, fires burn brighter, a promise of the years turning once more to the light. You are the architect of that much needed rest, the flake and the flurry that seems to stop time for a season. The earth needs you, loves you, thanks you. As the first sheets of champagne dawn emerge in the east, turning your frost sprinklings to pink and yellow prisms, you release a visible sigh, pleased with the night's work. 
You feel the warmth of the sun's rays on your icy wings as you retire to the banks of a babbling stream, making a nest of twigs and leaves. You like to be near water when you rest. It is the very essence of your gift, after all. And in these tender, transitional days, when the grasp of winter is not yet fully felt across the land, you like to be reminded of the power water has when still it can rush the beauty and fluidity with which it flows, making intangible shapes and pathways on its journey. Someday soon, you will freeze these waters and they'll hold their form for a time undefined, motionless and aching to break free. When the sun warms the waters again and their movement is unleashed, however, they'll retain the memory of the time they spent under your spell. Just as the flower remembers the time when it was a seed beneath frozen soil, and the seed remembers the embrace of the mother plant before it was dropped to grow on its own. And just as every drop of water in the ocean recalls that fine and fleeting time that it was a snowflake. Snow kicks up in clouds like puffs of powdered sugar in Scout's wake. In all the humming tranquility of the wintry afternoon about you, his energy is a wild disturbance, a cyclone through an otherwise motionless ghost town. You chuckle, watching your dog frolic through the driven snow, sparkling and soft. He hasn't seen snow in some time, and it's an overwhelming joy. You haven't either, come to think of it. Winters have become so mild where you live, you've almost forgotten the feel of snow collapsing and crunching beneath your boots. There's something marvelously satisfying about it, a quiet thrill to sinking a few inches with every step you take then a gentle comfort in feeling the solid ground at the bottom, catching you. Now Scout is rolling on his back, his tongue hanging from the side of his mouth, which is split into a wide, goofy grin. The fur on his belly is all white, so he almost disappears into the snow, visible only by his zestful stirring. Then he rolls once more onto his back and bounds toward you as if to say, look at all this. Are you seeing this too? Or to inquire how you can possibly resist the urge to dive into the snow yourself. The snow only stopped falling a half hour or so ago. Soon you and your neighbors will take to the sidewalks shovels and salt in hand, and start clearing the way. 
but for now there's a sweet stillness to be savored. The sky is still all white, almost indistinguishable from the horizon line. And you smile to think that you might, in all the hazy whiteness around you, step right into the sky and keep walking till you reached the stars. No one else is quite ready to come out of their homes yet, still cozy by the fire, you suppose, in their thick socks with their hot cocos. The snow is too powdery yet for snowball fights and snowmen. In the morning, it'll be wet and sticky enough for all that. For now, you've got this winter wonderland all to yourself, you and Scout. And it is wonderful, you decide. Though the air is cold and your breath dances in spirals before you and your nose is quite frozen, you feel a spark of kindled warmth from within. You reach down to scratch behind Scout's ears. The black and white border collie grins and pants by your side. The initial shock and wonder of the snow gives way to pure contentment. He walks by your side, at your pace, for a time. It doesn't last long, this covenant of companionship, him just at your feet, tail wagging in the knee-high drifts. No, there are rabbits running through the snow now, rabbits that must be chased. You're relieved to see that the little gray bunnies are too fast for your dog, but he's all the more invigorated by their cunning and speed. You're nearing the end of your street, where a footbridge crosses over a tiny stream, now frozen solid, and into a small, charming park. It all sits much lower than the street, as if a giant's hand had descended to scoop out a chunk of the earth here, then made that place fertile and perfect for slow strolls and contemplation. There's a large hill for sledding. You're sure by this time tomorrow it will be crawling with excited children on trash can lids and cardboard boxes. And there are several neatly pruned, exceedingly tall juniper trees planted at precise intervals along the snow-obscured path to give the illusion of spontaneity. Their silvery blue foliage whips toward the sky, dusted with snow. You and Scout come here often for walks. It's funny to see how starkly it transforms through the seasons. The woodsy, fresh, herbaceous scent of the juniper slices through the cold air, awakening your senses. You follow Scout into the hollow. He's still chasing the trails left by the rabbits in the snow. They're so small and light. They balance on the top layer of the frost not sinking into it like you and Scout. Watching them run from him is like watching skipping stones skim the surface of a lake. There's an ancient willow tree in the park, at the very lowest point of the hollow. The green all stripped from its weeping branches, it looks haunting, skeletal even. The narrow tendrils bending toward the earth are, you observe as you move closer to it, frozen stiff, all coated with ice and fasted in place. Even a strong wind might not set it to subtle movement, these woody icicles. Scout's rabbits seem to have escaped for good. There's no sign of them now save the faint tracks they leave in the snow. 
He turns to you, tail wagging and eyes sparkling. You pat him on the head. You and Scout continue your walk through the park, contented and close. It's so still, so peaceful and perfectly still. As though the very hands of time have frozen solid, letting all things pause. The earth feels to you like the moment before a deep exhale, as though the whole world's breath has been drawn up inside, creating a hidden warmth and mustering a great potential energy and is now preparing to let it all go. The afternoon is growing long and the midwinter sun, imperceptible though it may be behind the curtain of snow clouds, must be waning toward the horizon. A faint purple is visible past the pall of clouds and a stronger, concentrated magenta is radiating over the crest of the hill. You should probably be getting back, you think. It would be nice to take off these snowy boots and make some tea. Maybe read a little of your book and turn in early for bed. The holidays have worn you out and you're in need of some rest and recharging. Hibernation, you think, with a smile. Scout has strayed a few feet from you, and you whistle to him to turn around and head back up toward the street. His ears perk up when he hears your call, but he does not turn to look at you. Something else has his attention. Your eyes scan the ground for the source of his focus, and you just catch a glimpse of a tiny brown blur before it scampers off. Another rabbit has come out of its hole to torment the poor dog. Then Scout is off like a flash, running after the creature. You follow behind, but you don't feel the urgency to move all that fast. You trudge through the snow, your boots still sinking several inches with each step. You round the trunk of one of the juniper trees, following Scout's tracks, just in time to see his bushy white tail disappear into what looks like a solid snowdrift, nearly seven feet high. You stop in place, bemused half expecting to see him stumble back out, covered in snow like a cartoon creature. But he doesn't emerge right away, so you follow the path. There, where his tracks end, is the mouth of a narrow tunnel. Not so much larger than a rabbit hole, you suppose? but large enough indeed for a medium-sized dog to have tumbled in with plenty of room. You stop before it, unsure of what to do. You find yourself turning around in a circle, looking to see if anyone's around. But what difference would that make? You whistle, cutting through the still silence in the park. You call Scout's name, but there's no answer, no padding of paws, no bark of acknowledgement, no yelp of distress either. You crouch down, peering into the tunnel. Maybe you can see how far Scout's gone, perhaps reach in after him, but looking inside, it's clear that he's gone farther than you can reach. The tunnel seems to extend straight ahead rather than down into the ground like a rabbit hole. It's more like a man-made creation, really. You recall the long snow days of your childhood, 
playing with the neighborhood kids, sledding, building snowmen, building igloos and snow caves. Those caves you think were not so dissimilar to this. Perhaps somehow in the short time between the snowfall and this solitary stillness, someone from the neighborhood was out here, building tunnels, making mischief. After a few more fruitless whistles and shouts, you take a deep breath. There's nothing else to be done, you think, but to go in after him. Surely Scout can't have gotten far, and how far can the tunnel even go? So, you get down on your hands and knees, grateful for grabbing your thickest gloves and layering your clothing. There turns out to be more than enough room for you to comfortably crawl through the tunnel. You call Scout's name as you go, and your voice bounces off the snowy walls, echoing back to you. The tunnel is longer than you would have expected. Before you know it, you've been crawling for probably 20, 30 feet or more. Still, you whistle for Scout every few seconds, awaiting a response, or even the sound of scurrying feet ahead. You hope he's not too frightened. And the further you go, the less light there is. You turn on the flashlight on your phone and place it carefully in the breast pocket of your coat. The beam of light bobs with you as you crawl. Then, a few feet later, you see something unexpected. It's faint, but you're sure you haven't imagined it. There's a glimmer of silvery blue light, just a sliver of it, as though it's escaping from beneath the crack of a door. You crawl forward a little more eagerly now. A sparkle of deja vu is settling over you. Haven't you seen such a light before? With that spectral blue-white glow moving slowly like sunlight through salt water. Yes, you have. It seems so long ago now. Before you and Scout found each other. And life before Scout feels like a distant dream. It was a rainy day, a deluge really, a downpour so heavy it knocked out the power all down the street. On that rainy day, consumed by boredom, you followed the same blue light through a closet door. But the door didn't lead to your musty old closet. You haven't thought about it in such a long time. You thought it must have been a dream, born of an overactive imagination, starved for stimulation. But now it comes back to you clear as day. On that rainy day, your closet door led to an extraordinary place, a library that could not be believed, one with magic between the pages of its books. Now you approach the source of the blue light. You can see it shifting, rolling against the tunnel's snowy floor. You turn off your phone's flashlight, so the sliver of light is the only thing you can see. You reach out into the near darkness and your hand meets a surface, smooth and springy. You push forward gently, feeling only light resistance against your hand. 
Slowly, the light expands as a door, something like a door, but not quite a door, opens. You feel a sensation like water or wind rushing over you, then dissipating. Beyond the opening, the light is such a change from the dim tunnel that you must shield your eyes. You climb carefully through, feeling for solid ground with your feet, and land with a slight drop on a smooth floor. You can't help but gasp. A library indeed but not quite the one you remember. Vast and cavernous, with ceilings so high they seem to disappear into a snow-cloud sky, though you can make out the vaults and arches above, made of glass or crystal. The whole chamber, it seems, is made of that substance, the bookshelves, which stretch near to the ceiling, are clear as crystal, lined with books of all sizes and colors. Against the shelves, what look like snowdrifts are piled, pure and white and sparkling in the light of countless candles, which flicker in lamps lining the hall. The floor under your feet, too, is quite translucent, yet wholly solid. If you squint, you can almost see something through the floor beneath. There's movement, shifting light and shadows, but nothing coherent. Here and there are little nooks between the stacks each piled high with cushions and blankets, or nestled with cozy armchairs and quilts. And at the very heart of the library, hanging from the nearly invisible ceiling, is the thing that draws your eye and overwhelms you with awe. It's a chandelier, but unlike any chandelier you've ever seen, it seems to drip, to weep from the ceiling, like the delicate wisps of a willow tree, organic and irregular in shape, still and sparkling like a million diamond facets, casting the colors of the rainbow in shining shimmers across the room. You remove your gloves and run a hand along one of the glassy bookshelves. Instantly, you feel the sharp tingle of cold against your fingers. It's all made not of glass or sparkling crystal, but of ice. The chandelier, the shelves, the floor, all ice. And yet, though your breath is visible in clouds upon the air, the temperature in the library is pleasantly mild. Some magic must be at work to keep the ice and snow from melting, even as candles burn within the chamber. You turn to look behind you, back the way you came, at the small, window-like opening through which you crawled. Swinging it closed, you realize that the portal is covered with a framed painting, and you recognize the artwork. It's a painting you've always admired. Hunters in the Snow by Peter Bruegel the Elder. It's a wintry scene depicting a snow-blanketed hillside overlooking a village where people skate on a frozen lake. Mountains in the background are craggy and snow-capped. In the foreground, 
a pair of hunters return from the wood, followed by a gaggle of weary dogs. A magpie floats overhead. As you're admiring the detail in the painting up close and wondering how it can be here when you know very well it belongs in a museum in Vienna, though you suppose that's hardly the most fantastical thing in this place, you hear the distinct tapping of claws on the icy floor. You spin round and breathe a huge sigh of relief seeing Scout padding toward you, a smile across his face as he skids on the ice. You crouch down and rub his sides, letting him nuzzle your face. Now that he's here, you can relax. He seems perfectly at home here, and he stays close to your side as you begin to wander the stacks. The faintly frosted ice shelves and furnishings reflect you and Scout vaguely, like a mirror underwater. Here and there you find little follies, tabletop ice sculptures of scenes from well-known stories, like Don Quixote tilting at windmills, or the impish Peter Pan holding the fairy Tinkerbell in the palm of his hand. There's a great, long table fit for a banquet, but laden with books and scrolls of paper. At its middle is a glorious centerpiece, a stunning arrangement of anemone, eucalyptus, and protea encased within a block of ice. You look to the spines of the books on a nearby shelf. Gold thread shines against dark binding, some careworn, some like new. These here are collections of fairy tales. You find stories by the Brothers Grimm, Charles Perrault, Gabrielle Suzanne de Villeneuve, and Hans Christian Andersen. Your hand gravitates toward one of the Anderson collections, and you gingerly pull the book down. It slides from between its fellows smoothly. The book crackles slightly as you lift the cover, revealing a black and white engraving on the inside page. It's a lovely little illustration of a charming wood. At the center is a tiny evergreen tree, over which a sprightly hare is mid-leap. Looking to scout, almost for approval, you make your way to a cozy-looking nook underneath an icy arch. There's an oversized, overstuffed barrel chair in the corner, draped with a chunky knit blanket. The recess is lit softly by a flickering lamp, glowing almost golden in its throw. The chair is large enough for you and Scout both to snuggle up comfortably. You pull off your boots and put your feet up, drawing the blanket over your knees. Scout curls up against your feet. You appreciate his natural warmth against you. You crack the book of fairy tales open once more and flip past the table of contents to the first story contained within. You feel a shiver of excitement and anticipation when you read the title. The Snow Queen. And then there's the familiar tugging sensation, the whoosh, the whirl. Now suddenly you're being swept along an icy tunnel, one that sparkles with a thousand pinprick stars, snowflakes swirling all around you. 
Head over heels you tumble until at last you find your feet again, though the movement doesn't stop when you land. You've fallen right into the world of the story, the domain of the Snow Queen, right into her splendid white sleigh. You're dashing across the countryside in a pink and purple twilight. The sleigh is drawn by three white horses who gallop with such swiftness and grace their hooves seem not to touch the ground. The fresh scent of pine awakens your senses and the cold nips at your fingers. And now you look to the driver of the sleigh, the slender figure sitting just beside you. At first, you can only regard her from the corner of your eye, so dazzling is she. It's as though she shines bright as the sun, or the sun pure white. But slowly, little by little, you can take in her resplendent appearance. Her skin is pure white, whiter than the horses pulling the sleigh, paler even than the snow on the ground. Her hair, white and glistening like pearls, whips behind her on the wind from beneath a white fur cap. A white fur robe rests upon her shoulders, and underneath, a silk gown, also in the purest white, well, no, you think. It isn't fur or silk at all. It's snow. Snow spun into thread and cloth, the only material fit for such an icy, opulent queen. She is of surpassing beauty. Her features fine and elegant. She carries herself with the grace and vigor of a swan, gripping the reins of the three pure white horses. When she inclines her head ever so slightly to look at you, you feel your face flush and hastily you turn away. It's almost too much to make eye contact with her. She seems, to you, like a snowstorm come to life, with all the delicate grace of the snowflake on the wind, and all the gusty, unfathomable power of a force of nature. On you go across the land, watching the evening dim to a deep blue night. A dizzying array of stars blink to life overhead, and a full moon lends its sparkling opalescence to the fields of snow, the horses, the carriage, and its impressive driver. On she drives deep into increasingly remote country. Evergreen forests and snow-topped mountains in the distance a slow-moving herd of reindeer in the snow. You feel weightless, gliding, skimming over the snow. You feel like at any moment the horses could kick off the ground and prance right up into the sky. As the night gathers its darkness, you look to the sky and behold... Oh, wonder, there in the star-speckled blackness, a ribbon of luminescence, sheer and shifting, bluish-green and becoming more alive with each passing moment. The Aurora Borealis, the dazzling, dancing lights of the North. 
Now an edge of vibrant pink twists through the spirals of light. You're struck with awe, captivated by the display, one you never thought you'd observe firsthand so captivated that it takes you a moment to realize the sleigh's driver, the Snow Queen, is speaking to you. Her voice is cold but comforting, like a layer of frost upon a candlelit window. We've traveled fast, she says. You must be freezing. Until now, you had hardly noticed, so wonderstruck were you by the landscape and lights. But yes, you find you're shivering, unprepared for such arctic temperatures. You nod, trembling. The Snow Queen smiles a warm, tender-hearted smile, like sunlight melting snow. As the horses glide still across the snow, the lady bows to kiss you on the forehead. Where her lips land, you feel an icy cool sensation, which travels down over your entire body, into your veins and deep into your heart. For a moment, you feel as though you've turned to ice, frozen solid. But then the sensation releases, and you're left feeling almost nothing at all, numb to the cold and protected from it. We're almost home, the Snow Queen says, gesturing to something straight ahead upon the horizon. As you squint to see it, the horse-drawn sleigh barrels ever closer. There, taking shape before you, is a magnificent palace, seven-spired and grand as Versailles, huge and sprawling and clinging to the side of a craggy cliff and entirely made of ice. Its glorious towers and eaves and verandas, all ice, sparkle and pick up the colors of the dancing aurora, reflecting and refracting them in perfect prisms. With an ache of curiosity, you regard the ice palace. But there's a twinge, too, of longing for home, a shadow of disquiet about this place this Snow Queen. You look back at the way from which you came. All is snow and silky darkness under the northern lights. You feel homesick, says the Snow Queen, cutting through your thoughts to the truth. You feel yourself nodding numbly, would you like to forget your other life? To live unburdened by unhappy memories? To live in my palace and eat and drink whatever you like and have everything your heart desires? You turn to face the Snow Queen, flinching slightly at the intensity of her beauty and her expression. There is something irresistible about her offer. You feel yourself bending toward it like the wisps of a willow tree on the wind. You know that if she gives you one more kiss on the forehead, you'll forget everything but what's right in front of you. You want to give in. But then you think of Scout, curled up at your feet, back in the library. You think of the house on the corner, 
of friends and family. As the Snow Queen stoops to kiss you once more, you screw up your eyes tight, willing the image of the ice palace out of your head and wishing yourself back in the barrel chair with the blanket. Whoosh, whirl, snowflakes sprinkling your skin and melting against your body heat. A feeling of warmth at your feet. The heaving of Scout's breath. You open your eyes. You're back in the library. Scout is snoozing softly. He doesn't seem to have noticed your absence at all. You close the book on your lap, laughing and run a hand across its textured cover. You never thought, when you set out for a walk today, that within the hour you'd find yourself sledding across Lapland under the Aurora Borealis. And what other adventures might you have by stepping into the pages of these wonderful books You could visit King Arthur's court, you suppose, or gather around the fireplace with the March sisters. You emerge from your reading nook to seek out another volume. The shelves, of course, are not organized according to any recognizable library system, but seem to unfold with their own surreal logic responding to your unspoken wishes. You find yourself perusing a shelf of books that have nothing else discernible in common, but that each features a character who attends boarding school. Another shelf contains books that all take place in your hometown. Books that are best read in the summer when the days are long and you can sit outside. Books about amateur detectives. Books inspired by ancient mythology. Books that describe food and feasts with such sumptuous specificity that your mouth waters as you read. You stumble upon a small round table carved of ice, laden with books. Flickering tapers shine in an ice candelabra, casting a warm glow across the covers of the books. Your eyes fall on a mahogany volume, gilt-edged and worn. On the cover, stamped in gold, is the encircled silhouette of a queen crowned and holding a scepter. Your lips curl into a smile as you slip the volume into your hands, tuck it under your arm, and carry it back to your reading nook. Settling into the chair once more, Scout sleeping soundly at your feet, you crack open Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll. Though you're not sure why, this sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland always struck more of a chord with you than its predecessor. Perhaps because it takes as its central structural device the game of chess, which intrigues you so. Or perhaps because the idea of stepping through a mirror into another reality was always more appealing to you than tumbling headfirst down a rabbit hole. In any case, as the book falls open on your lap, you find yourself tumbling indeed. A whoosh and a whirl and you're off, spinning down a narrow tunnel toward a blinding light. 
Your head feels pleasantly light, and you think you can hear, faintly, the ticking of a clock from somewhere not too far off. You land with a bounce and a bluster on a thick cushioned armchair, catching your breath. The ticking sound is louder, present, and coming, you discover, from the antique clock on the mantelpiece. Behind it, above the fireplace, is a huge looking glass in which you can now see your reflection. It's your reflection, surely, but you're younger, childlike somehow, and dressed in 19th century children's clothes. It's rather amusing, really. You take in your surroundings, an ornate Victorian drawing room. There are upholstered chairs with golden tassels side tables displaying botanicals in bell jars, and before you, a chess set with the most exquisitely carved pieces. The whole chamber is dimly lit, warm and cozy with its maximalist appointment. You glance outside the window to see heavy snowflakes falling in clumps through the darkness accumulating on the windowsill. Feeling a funny sensation at your feet, you look down to notice two kittens pawing at your shoes. One kitten, fluffy and white as a snowball, and the other sleek, svelte and black, with golden eyes. You feel your heart melt with tenderness toward them. They're so tiny, you can scoop one up in each hand. They mew and squirm as you hold them to eye level. Snowdrop, you call the white one, remembering how Alice named it in the book. And Kitty, to the black one, though you wish Alice had been more creative in naming this one. You set them back at your feet, where they play at wrestling and pawing still at your shoes. You ponder the position of the chess pieces on the table beside you, inspect the dried daisies and dahlias under bell jar glass, and even sneak a bite of a biscuit laid from a china plate. Then, though you're enjoying the simple pleasures of the study, your gaze drifts to the ornamental mirror on the mantel. It can't be avoided, nor can it be resisted. What might the world look like, you wonder, on the other side of the looking glass? You see the room reflected in reverse, in the surface of the glass. Though it's a perfect copy, you can sense that something special lies beyond. The two tiny kittens look on with curiosity as you pull up your stockings and climb carefully onto the mantel. It's quite the tricky balancing act, you find. With a deep breath and a final glance back at the room, the chessboard, the kittens, you place a hand delicately on the surface of the mirror. Instead of cold, hard glass, the surface is like springy liquid, offering only the mildest resistance as you push your hand through. Now your whole arm, and your other arm, and now there is nothing else to do but lean all the way forward, all the way in, 
and through the looking glass. With a strange, tingling sensation, you step through the other side of the mirror. You stand again upon the mantel, but you face the alternate direction. And indeed, opening your eyes, the room looks quite the same as before, just... Well, it's uncanny somehow. Reversed, but also distorted, as though seen through the filter of a dream. Nothing out of place, and yet nothing where it should be. You think of that painting, The Persistence of Memory, by Dali, and you half expect to see the mantel clock melting into the fireplace. But it's subtler than that, much subtler. You step down cautiously off the mantelpiece and inspect the details of the looking glass room. Though it gave off such a surreal impression you find, on closer investigation, no discernible defects. Nothing off at all, despite the feeling of disorientation. It's as though your very gaze and attention put things to rights underneath your nose. Like mischief or madness is carrying on just in the corners of your eyes, but when you turn to observe the commotion, it vanishes. You pull a book from a shelf at eye level. Not lost on you is the irony of opening a book when you yourself are within the pages of one. Its pages, however, are flooded with jumbled nonsense, an arrangement of letters so absurd and illegible that you feel, once again, as though you're walking through a dream. But then a notion strikes you, and you cross with the book to the fireplace. You hold the nonsense page up to the looking glass, where the letters, reversed and reflected, begin to make a certain sense. Well, almost makes sense. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. You read aloud already slouching into the lilting rhythm of the poem. All mimsy were the bara groves, and the momraths out grave. Despite the words being themselves gibberish, and the tone being somewhat ominous, the poem is so instantly familiar that it warms you to your core. After reading it through in the reflection, you set the book down and continue exploring the looking glass room. You look to the chess table, where the pieces are already placed as though mid-game. You struggle to remember if it's the same formation as on the other side of the mirror. You pick up one of the white pieces, a knight and admire its intricate carvings. Then, to your surprise, the piece begins to move, wriggling as though trying to get free of your grasp. You're so surprised you almost drop the piece to the floor, but instead you carefully set it back on the board, in the square you think it was placed on before. You must have guessed wrong, however, for as you crouch to the level of the table to look closely at the other pieces, you find they're all in an uproar. Every single piece has come to life, 
and mass confusion has been caused by your error in placement. It seems you made such a move as to thwart one side's imminent checkmate, and you've thrown the gambit into chaos. This seems like as good a time as any other to return to the library. Though you're curious what lies outside the looking glass house, if your knowledge of chess is any indication, you won't fare too well in this world. And besides, you've had enough of queens. Blocking out the tiny, squeaking shouts of the upset chess pieces, you squeeze your eyes tight and visualize the library, wishing yourself back in the cozy reading nook. There's the whoosh and the whirl and the collapsing cushions of the chair beneath you. You're back, surrounded by books and icicles, nestled in the chair with your faithful dog. Lazily, you return to the shelves, itching for one last trip into the magical world of stories. One more adventure, then surely it'll be time to go home. As though the library has read your mind, anticipated your craving for a warm, cozy escape, you stumble upon a shelf of books that all have one thing in common. Each is centered around anthropomorphic animals. Your gaze lingers on Watership Down, Winnie the Pooh, even Redwall. But then your heart flutters at the sight of a dark green binding Leaves of acanthus embellish the title along the spine. You slide the book off the shelf to look at the cover. There in embossed gold is the image of a satyr playing his pan flute, crouched in the reeds and overlooking two small animals, a mole and a rat, in a boat along a river. Beneath the striking image, the words, The Wind in the Willows. This book, more than any of the others, has a smell to it. Not just the smell of an old book, musty and chocolatey, but a smell of childhood, of grass and earth, of savory stews, of spring breeze, an indescribable concoction of nostalgia. You carry the book back to your reading area. As you sit down, Scout stirs, smiling in his sleep. You pat his head gently, and you open the book. This time you savor the whoosh and the whirl and the tumbling through the tunnel. When you land, you find your feet crunching on crisp snow. You take in your surroundings. It's certainly a wild and windy night with snow falling all around. You're grateful to see when you look to your feet that you're wearing galoshes which insulate you from the dampness of the snow. It seems, though the snow falls so thickly it's hard to mark where you are, that you're trudging through a dark, wild forest. On such a night, what were you thinking, leaving the safety of home? The trees, silhouetted, are enormous, tall as skyscrapers, making you feel oh very small indeed. Still, you continue on 
in the direction you are going. Perhaps you're only steps away from a warm hearth. But after many more minutes, the snow swirling round and blurring your vision, you begin to worry that you're lost in this wild wood. Perhaps you think you should return to the library now and save an adventure like this for another day. Just as you're about to screw up your eyes and wish yourself back to the reading nook, you hear a faint sound behind you, something distinct from the swish of the wind or the patter of snow. It's the sound of little footsteps and a voice on the air. The voice is calling your name. Only it's not your name, is it? It's the name of the character whose galoshes you've fallen into. The voice is calling for Mole. You turn round seeking the owner of the voice, and through the curtains of snow he emerges. A slender water vole is stumbling toward you, wrapped in a scarf and coat. At the sight of you he sighs with relief. You feel it too, a sense of warm, rushing affection for the creature, and gratitude that he's here by your side. The Vol, Ratty by name, can't believe you've gone and got yourself lost in the wild wood. This kind of place is not fit for a river banker like you, and should only be crossed in pairs, certainly never in weather like this. You apologize sheepishly, explaining that you were only hoping to find the home of Mr. Badger after everything you've heard about him. At this, instead of marching you right back home, Rat decides to accompany you through the wood. A nice cup of tea with Badger might be just what the doctor ordered. As you walk with your friend, the snow begins to thin and cease entirely and stars peek through the gaps in the trees, like diamonds hanging upon their branches. Even with the cold, it warms your heart to walk side by side with such a charming, kind companion. The time passes fleetly with the lighthearted conversation. At last you come to a snowbank so tall it's impossible to see over, and so wide it's nearly impassable. Rat seems stumped. He's certain Mr. Badger's residence is close by, but however will you traverse such an obstacle? Feeling your heart fall, the two of you decide that with the hour growing ever later and your bones this weary, you'll simply have to retire for the night and search again for Badger's home in the morning. Rat volunteers to dig a nice hole for you to crawl into where you'll be safe. Wasting no time, he begins to burrow deep into the snowdrift. You're impressed with the speed and diligence of his work. You yourself are so tired from the journey, you can't contribute. But as Ratty digs deeper and deeper into the snowbank, you hear an unexpected sound. The unexpected sound of Rat's paws meeting something hard and hollow. Mole, come down here, will you? Your friend calls. Hastily, you crawl down the tunnel of snow to meet him. There at the end of the tunnel, Ratty shifts aside to reveal a solid-looking little door. 
painted dark green as the forest trees. By its side hangs an iron bell pole, and below it, on a small brass plate, neatly engraved in square capital letters are the words, Mr. Badger. You find yourself laughing with glee. Raddy has done it. He's found the home of Mr. Badger. Rat looks to you expectantly, then gestures to the bell pole. With only a moment's hesitation, you reach for the pole and ring it. You hear within the echoing low tone of the bell. It's some time before there's any response, but just as you're about to ring the bell again, you can hear the shuffling of slippered feet beyond the door and low grunts. Now, who is it? comes a gruff voice, disturbing me at this time of night, ringing my bell like it's midday. You shrink, but Ratty knocks pleasantly and calls inside, identifying himself. Instantly, the voice behind the door changes. Ratty, my good fellow, the voice calls. Why didn't you say so? The sound of a bolt snatch sliding and the creak of the door swinging wide open. In the doorway stands a stately fellow indeed with downy fur of black and white, beady black eyes and a long snout, robed for bed and feet beslippered, a candlestick in one paw. It's Mr. Badger indeed. Abandoning all the annoyance of before, he jovially beckons you in, embracing Ratty and shaking your paw enthusiastically. He ushers you all the way inside and toward the hearth, where he'll light a fire and you can rest and warm up from the cold. Have you had supper? You'll make supper too. You're welcome to it. Mr. Badger's home seems the pure opposite of the wide, wild forest. Warm and dry, snug and enclosed, with a central chamber from which many tunnels and passages lead off into mysterious darkness. Badger brings you warm dressing gowns, slippers and blankets, you savor the feeling of pulling on dry socks, toasting your feet beside the roaring fire. Everywhere from the rafters hang bundles of dried herbs, nets of onions, and strung hams. With the smoke from the fire, the room smells like a harvest feast, savory and spicy. It seems a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table and keep their harvest home with mirth and song, or where two or three friends of simple tastes could sit about as they pleased and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. You sink into your chair as Badger busily sets the table and as Rat regales him with an exaggerated version of your wandering through the wild wood. Badger's hospitality and general pleasantries leave you with a sense of effusive pleasure. You feel so cozy, so cared for, and so content among these fellows that your heart seems to overflow with feeling. Once you're sufficiently warmed by the fire, Badger summons you to the table 
where you share a supper fit for a celebratory feast. The glow of the fire plays across the serving dishes and silverware and the faces of your friends. Mouths so full as to halt the conversation, you enjoy every morsel with a thankful heart. Then, sated and sleepy, the three of you return to the hearth to bask in the embers of the fire and converse about the goings-on in the world. You talk of Mr. Toad and his new obsession with motor cars, of the many mishaps he's had in this craze. You're so captivated by Mr. Badger's manner of speech that you hardly notice Ratty's nodded off several times. You suppose it is very late. You ought to be getting to bed. But the fire is so nice. And the company even more pleasant. You focus on the sensation of radiant warmth from the fire. The way it tickles your toes and prickles up your legs. The feeling of toasty socks and soft slippers on your feet. the crackling sound of the fire. The way it reflects off the red brick floor and the smoky oaken ceiling. The smell of herbs and onions You feel a sense of deep comfort, safety, and relaxation from the tips of your toes to the top of your head, from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. Warmth in your heart. Sweetness and softness in your body. Limbs loosening. Relaxing into the surface of the chair. The feeling of safe anchorage, coziness below ground, the sturdiness of the chair in which you sit, holding and supporting you, a tender sense of security. You want to hold this moment, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the sensations, forever in your heart, and return to it again and again. You feel your eyelids growing heavy coaxed to close by the heat of the fire. You don't want to fall asleep just yet. You want to savor this feeling for a little while longer. But despite your trying to hold your eyes open, keep your mind just alert 
Eventually, you surrender to the waves of sleepiness, working their spell upon you. Your eyelids fall closed. A gentle whoosh. A subtle whirl. You don't open your eyes just yet, but you feel a shift in the temperature, the atmosphere, the heaviness of the blanket across your knees, the feeling of the books binding against your fingers. You're back in the library. A scout is curled at your feet. You rest here together for a little while longer. Your body still tingling, holding and harmonizing with the feeling of pure security and intimacy you felt in Badger's underground home. You let the feeling sink into your bones soften into your memories. Then at last, feeling that all things must sometime come to an end, you scratch behind Scout's ears and pull yourself from the comfort of the reading nook. Scout yawns and leaps off the chair, following you past the stacks, beneath the willowy chandelier and its ice crystals, over the snow drifts, weaving through the ice sculptures. You approach the painting, Hunters in Snow and swing the frame wide, revealing the passage beyond. Together with your faithful dog, you crawl back through the tunnel, out into the snowy basin of the park. It's dark out, stars blinking like gemstones against the velvet sky. so peaceful. Past the tendrils of the icy willow tree and the snow-kissed foliage of the junipers, off, over the bridge, up the hill toward the street. Off you go, together, through the night, toward home. The door to the oven opens, sending a warm and aromatic wave across the room to flush your cheeks. Your grandmother, with her gingham oven mitts, pulls two baking sheets from the hot oven and fans them to start cooling them down. Oh, and the smell is simply heavenly. There's Ginger, of course, at the head of it all, but the warm, malty molasses brings sweetness to the spice. Cinnamon, allspice, and clove waltz with the uplifting vanilla. It's true what they say, that scent can unlock memories better than any other sense. As you inhale, 
pictures dance through your mind, the faces of family and loved ones, snuggly evenings by the fire, warm bubble baths after hours playing in the cold snow. To you, nothing says home like fresh baked gingerbread. The days are getting much shorter. It's hardly five o'clock in the afternoon, and already it seems that night is nipping at your heels. Outside the kitchen window, the sun is making its final descent in the sky, casting pink and orange swirls across the sky like sherbet, the fluffy clouds like dollops of whipped cream. It looks good enough to eat, you think. It's a tradition in your family to bake and build a gingerbread house together, all from scratch. You've always been strictly on decoration, spreading the icing, sticking on the gumdrops. But this year, for the first time, your grandmother brought you into the kitchen while she whipped up the cookie dough. You watched her cream the butter and brown sugar. She even let you pour in the molasses, which was mesmerizing to watch as it pooled in ribbons in the bowl. You tried to take notes in your head of the proper ratio of spices and the perfect time to add the secret ingredient, finely minced, crystallized ginger. But grandmother laughed as she observed your look of keen concentration. There was no need, she insisted, to think so hard about it. She's been making this recipe for so long, it comes naturally to her. But not to worry, everything's written down on a recipe card she'll give to you. And besides, she assured you, while it's necessary to master certain techniques and to get particular ingredients in the exact right amount, no recipe is truly great without an opportunity to improvise, to put a little of your own creativity into the baking. Gingerbread is equal parts science and art, she said, tapping her forehead with a playful grin. She followed this with a whispered encouragement to lick the spoon, if you like. Together, you rolled out the dough thin and cut it into precise rectangles and triangles, perfect for assembling a strong gingerbread house. Once it comes out of the oven, it's clear to you that the baking was a success. The gingerbread settles and cools on the counter as your grandmother guides you in whipping up a royal icing. Then, with armfuls of gumdrops, marshmallows, and starlight mints, you follow her to the kitchen table, where your young cousins are giddy with excitement to begin the assembly. Constructing the house out of gingerbread so that it stands up and all the pieces fit together, that is science, but everything else is art. How to pipe the icing on the roof to look most like shingles or blankets of snow, where to place the little decorative candies for the most dramatic flare. Dozens of tiny fingers reach for chocolate kisses and marshmallows, some of which actually make it onto the gingerbread house, the rest of which 
disappear surreptitiously into little bellies. Of course, there are good-natured arguments among the cousins as to how the house should look, but in the end, everyone has a chance to make their mark. It may be rustic in its construction and extravagant in its decoration, but this little cookie cottage could not look more inviting, you decide. And it's even more special for the myriad efforts of the family and the pride in all faces round the table. A simmer pot on the stove fills the house with the cozy aroma of warm sage, bright cranberries and oranges, and spicy ginger and cinnamon. Hot cocoa warms in the crock pot, and the mulled cider besides. These are ladled into mugs and placed in hands as a fire is made in the hearth. The family gathers beside the fire, which crackles and sparks in a gentle lullaby. From your cushion, wrapped in a flannel blanket and clutching your steaming mug, you can see the gingerbread house exalted upon the table with the moonlight falling over it from the window. In this light, even in all its childlike adornment, it might be a real cottage at the end of a storybook lane, a sweet, welcoming home for wanderers in the snow. With hot drinks on your lips and the fire murmuring beneath a wisp of festive music, Someone shares a family memory from many years ago. The story, oft told at gatherings like this, is so well known that even the youngest among you could recount it. And yet, it never grows old or tiresome. It brings a well of joy to your heart and smiles to all the rosy faces around the fire. Soon, this single story opens the doors to countless reminiscences, recollections of family legends, remembrances of loved ones who aren't present tonight, and celebrations of those new friends partners, and children who have come into the family in recent years. Stories of the places sacred to your family, the old houses which, though the faucets leak and the bedrooms were drafty, held such profound meaning and memory to those who lived and visited there. The favorite parks and playgrounds where you learned to ride bikes without training wheels. The gardens where you searched for gnomes and left gifts for the fairies. There is a secret language shared by every close-knit family a labyrinth of symbols and signals that bind you together, weaving a mythology out of memories. You feel immeasurably safe here, surrounded by people who know your truest self and love you even more for it. Your eyelids sink and your body settles into a fuzzy, natural warmth. You could drift off to sleep right here, you think, 
on the hearth rug and be perfectly happy. As the fire dies down in the fireplace and stars begin their twinkling dance outside the frosty window panes, the evening comes to a natural close. Your grandmother covers the gingerbread house with a glass dessert dome under which it resembles a fairy tale cottage in a snow globe. Along with your cousins, you slowly make your way upstairs where each of you performs your personal bedtime ritual. The littlest among you are tucked in with bedtime stories, lullabies, and kisses. You sink into the plush blankets, still feeling the pleasant, golden spell of comfort wash over you. The moon shines in delicately through a small gap in your curtains falling like spun silk across the bed. In the final moments of wakefulness, as your eyes fall closed, you picture the gingerbread house that now sits in the peace of an empty downstairs with glittering snow globe flurries accumulating on its frosted rooftop. You slide into tranquil dreams of sparkling brooks through snowy forests. The sky is still dark when you find yourself stirring. This you can tell with a glance at the sheer curtains. But something in the quality of light has shifted. There's a silvery edge to it. You wonder at first if you've awoken just before dawn. You roll over in bed, settling into the warmest parts of the mattress and pulling the covers up to your chin. You close your eyes, hopeful that sleep will once again overtake you. But behind your eyelids, the allure of that silvery light spirals, beckoning. Your curiosity rouses, overruling your body's will to slide back into sleep. So, you open your eyes once more and rise slowly from the bed. Parting the curtains, you discover the cause of the light's otherworldly shimmer. Your eyes brighten. Snow is falling. Indeed, it must have begun some hours ago for the street outside your window is already blanketed with a few inches of powdery snow, piling in irregular slopes and drifts. The flakes fall in twirling clumps from the darkness of sky. Moonbeams slice through fluffy gray clouds to turn the landscape silver and opalescent. It's been some time since you saw a snow like this. And at this hour, with the street vacant, it's achingly picturesque. Powder tops the streetlights and flurries dance through yellow beams. It's a transfixing sight. The whole neighborhood suspended in time and snow, 
crystallize and peaceful under a muted moon. How soft and undisturbed looks the snow. How satisfying might it be to be the first to let your feet fall through it, letting it collapse and crunch beneath your boots. You can hardly wait for morning when all your cousins will be awake and eager to throw snowballs and build little people out of snow. But for now, there's something magical about knowing you're the only one who sees this pristine spectacle. It's all delightfully yours. Carrying a spark of joy tempered by the warmth of extraordinary peace, you release a long exhale, dropping your shoulders and letting your face relax into a dreamy smile. You're ready to climb back into bed and shuffle back into the serene dream state from which you've just emerged. But as you turn from the window, you could swear there comes a warm light, one that's distinct from the street lamps, and a sound, too, a sound so specific and evocative that it's hard to believe you could have heard such a thing. But yes, there it is again, ringing in the night, the lively, rhythmic, percussive sound of jingle bells. Drawing the curtain aside once more, you watch a few final flakes of snow fall in the pools of light before the snowfall ceases and all is at once impossibly still. And now, in the absence of flurries, you can see clearly the houses on the other side of the quiet street. At first, they appear normal, simply coated in a layer of frosty powder. But then, a little gasp rises to your throat. These are not the aging, quirky Victorian houses you recognize. At least, not exactly. If you're not mistaken, every building on the block, instead of stucco or siding or brick, is made of gingerbread. The whole neighborhood transformed into a festive, romantic wonderland. It's this realization that makes it near impossible to climb back beneath the covers now. A miracle like this is something that must be explored. You dash to your closet and pull down a thick fleece robe. You slide your feet into a pair of fuzzy slippers and tie the robe closed. It takes a good deal of restraint of your excitement to tiptoe down the stairs instead of thundering downward. The lower level of the house is quiet. You catch a glimpse of the gingerbread house under its glass dome, just as you pull the front door closed behind you. 
with the smallest of creaks. The cold night air greets you, instantly making your cheeks flush. Your breath forms swirling clouds before you, but underneath the woolly robe and flannel pajamas, and with your feet snug in your slippers, you are warm. You step out into the night. Strung across the street in rows are countless golden fairy lights which gently illuminate the scenic walk. You marvel at the stately homes lining the road, each a magnificent confection. Gingerbread bungalows dusted with powdery snow, their sugar pane windows glowing from within, gumdrops lining the eaves. And each is more decadent, it seems, than the last. You imagine that within the houses, gingerbread families huddle together telling their own most cherished stories. You stroll enthralled down the lane. By the light of day, you know it to end in a cul-de-sac several houses down. But now, under the glistening moon, it seems to stretch on for miles before you with more colorful lights diffusing from the distance. All around, the sound of bells seemed to ride the delicate breeze. Soon, the gingerbread cottages give way to larger, more elaborate buildings, what seem to be gingerbread libraries gingerbread businesses, shops, and schools. The air begins to fill with the sweet overtones of music and a lively atmosphere. If you're not mistaken, there are voices on the breeze, singing, laughing, and conversing in the night. You are approaching a brightly lit crossroads, all abuzz with activity. As you come closer, it appears to be a bustling village square. Your eyes drink in the myriad sights and wonders that materialize there. At the center, there revolves a magnificent carousel with glittering lights and jumping horses and reindeer. The frame, of course, is gingerbread, but the structure is held up by beams of striped peppermint candy. Towering over it is the impressive form of a great tree, which, under usual circumstances, would boast evergreen tresses, but here its familiar silhouette is shaped by profiteroles and pinwheel cookies adorned with bright mints and candy baubles. Lining the square are gingerbread stalls from which swirl the scents of roasting chestnuts, hot cocoa, and other seasonal delights. But what truly lights up your eyes more than the decadent towers and structures of sweets are the people riding the carousel gazing up at the tree 
and milling about this square. There are dozens of them, and every single one, like you, shuffling about in slippers and pajamas, wrapped in bathrobes and housecoats. It's as if each of you independently rose to the sound of sleigh bells and wandered out into the snow. It's a veritable playground for the sleepless and bright-eyed. You make your way around the market stalls, admiring the sugary icicles that cling to their rooftops and the handmade gifts and mouth-watering sweets they peddle. You come to a stall selling beautiful, intricate snow globes. These sparkle under the fairy lights like a thousand little diamonds. Their bases are crusted around with peppermints and caramels. Each depicts a wintry scene, festive trees, snowmen, nutcrackers, and more. You inch closer to the displays, standing on tiptoes to get a good look at the beautiful tableaus. Your eyes widen to see one that's quite familiar. Beneath the curved glass dome, a gaggle of children and family members gather around a kitchen table, assembling a rustic gingerbread house. How the artist has managed to create such lifelike, joy-filled little faces and expressions in such small figures is simply marvelous to you. And there, under glittery flecks of swirling snow, is one bright face that quite resembles yours, as if the memory of this evening, the family coming together to create a gingerbread masterpiece, has been frozen in time and preserved forever. What a beautiful thing. You wish your loved ones were here to share it with you. But perhaps you think you can bring it home to them. There's a kindly looking man behind the counter at the stall. He's busy polishing the glass spheres of his magnificent creations. He peers over at you, transfixed by the uncanny resemblance of this snow globe to your own family. Found one you like, he says, a twinkle in his eye. Yes, you say, this one, it's funny, reminds me of, but you don't finish the thought aloud. Tell you what, says the merchant, it's yours, on the house. Really, you ask, a flush rising to your cheeks. He responds with only a wink. You pull the snow globe down from the display gingerly. It has a pleasant weight in your hands. Then you give it a good shake, and the speckles of sparkling snow rush upward in a dizzying spiral, then come fluttering down upon the scene. 
The merchant offers to wrap it up for you, to keep it safe. He rolls it in layers of snug brown paper, seals it with tape, then places it in a small green gift bag with ribbon handles. You thank him, still amazed at the gesture of generosity, and go on your way. You wind around the gingerbread carousel, admiring the leaping animals. Here you can see the varnished creatures in exquisite detail. Reindeer embellished with chocolate noses and licorice antlers. Horses with manes of candy floss. Unicorns and narwhals with candy cane horns. And you approach the spectacular tree, that imposing tower of bonbons spun with caramel and speckled with gumdrops and candied hazelnuts. When at last you've made a full circle around the village square, taking in all the honeyed splendor of it, your eyes turn to the darkened road that leads on from the lights. There's something that lies that direction, something that seems to tug at you, urging you to explore. In the hazy glow, you can just make out that the road, covered with snow though it may be, tapers off into a narrow walking path. You can't explain it, but you feel you must follow the path. So, with a final glance back at the wonderful sight of the square, you trudge on through the soft snow. The path does indeed narrow and it leads directly into the heart of a curious forest. But this forest is not shaded by conifers or deciduous trees. No, instead what grows here are candy canes striped round with red, green, and white. The calming scent of peppermint suffuses the air. As you step into the candy cane wood, allowing the bustle of the square and all its music and laughter to fall away, you feel an instantaneous settling of peace. You draw a deep breath which fill your belly and nourish your whole body. Each exhale feels cleansing, as if you are bathing in the cooling, detoxifying aroma of mint. It's as if every pore of your body is breathing in and releasing whatever it is that you no longer need. You step over a little stream that runs through a divot in the snow. Candy fish swim in the icy cold waters. On you go through the forest of candy canes, through thick patches and moonlit glades feeling as if you're riding on air. In time, the heavy clouds overhead open up, releasing fresh flurries of snow 
which gather and clump, falling softly on the already thick blanket upon the ground. The snow accumulates upon the candy cane trees like little hats and it falls with a barely perceptible plink upon your head and shoulders, more noticeably on your cheeks and nose where it melts. With a sudden impulse, you stop walking and turn your face to the sky, opening your mouth. You can see the snow spiraling downward in irregular patterns through the darkness, picking up the wind or meeting other snowflakes in a loving dance. A few flakes fall upon your outstretched tongue. They are sweet, like powdered sugar. And on you go as the snow picks up, turning the candy cane forest into a sight more picturesque than ever before. The ribbon-handled bag swings gently beside you, and for the first time, you feel a hint of a chill and a twinge of desire for your warm bed in the familiar house. You suppose you should turn back, retrace your steps through the forest and the square. It shouldn't be too hard, despite the snow falling more thickly, your tracks are still quite visible and deep. But before you are ready to turn around, you glimpse light through the parting candy cane trees. Street lights, you think? You move forward, thinking you'll be able to get your bearings here before making your way home. Within a few paces, you emerge from the wood onto the roundabout pattern of a cul-de-sac. You look for a street sign to point your way, but it quickly becomes clear that you know exactly where you are. Have you come round in a circle then? This is your street transformed as it may be by snow, and only a handful of houses down, you should find your own place. You look back at the candy cane forest. Is it only an illusion, or can you faintly see the glimmer of lights from the festival square through the thicket? The snow is coming down more heavily, and you draw the fleece robe tightly around your shoulders as you wade through the drifts, past the gingerbread cottages and cars. At last, as the snow is piling up to your knees, you reach your front door with relief. For just a moment, you gaze up at the house you know so well, the air assembled of your grandmother's spicy sweet gingerbread, adorned with gumdrops, kisses, and peppermints, with a thick icing of snow on the roof and eaves. The house made of memories. Then, shaking the sugary snow from your hair and kicking it from your slippers, 
you push the front door open and meet a wave of welcome warmth. All is quiet, save for the ticking of the hall clock, a constant metronome. Everyone else is still asleep, your absence as yet unnoticed, leaving your wet slippers on the mat by the door, you sneak your way up the stairs and into your bedroom where you dispose of the robe and change into a dry pair of pajamas. You warm your hands by the radiator and find yourself laughing. What a wondrous adventure you've had and without anyone being the wiser. A ripple of exhaustion moves through you from head to toe, your shoulders slumping and eyelids drooping. Surely, you'll be able to slip gently back into sleep. But first, you take one more glance out the window through the parted curtains. Snow is coming down so thickly, it's hard to see much. But you can make out the old Victorian house across the street. Gingerbread, gumdrops, and all. And with a great gaping yawn, you climb back into your bed, sliding between the blankets, grateful for the warmth and comfort of home. Sleep comes on like the first fall of snow. Gently, slowly, and then giving way all at once. This sleep is so deep and still, it is dreamless, ultimate peace. You wake to new light streaming through the parted curtains, sunlight now you recognize. From the cracked bedroom door, you catch the smell of pancakes and syrup climbing the stairs from the kitchen. Breakfast must be on the skillet. You shuffle down the steps to find the rest of your family already awake and energetic. They greet you with warm choruses of here comes the sleepy head, and so on. You must have slept much longer than usual. As you sit down to eat breakfast, with the family's gingerbread house serving as a delightful centerpiece, the previous night's adventure comes back to you in bits and pieces, the way one might remember a particularly strange and wonderful dream. But surely that's all it was, a dream. After breakfast, someone asks if the papers come yet. You volunteer to step outside and bring it in. You open the front door to a landscape of dazzling white. The morning sun reflects brightly off of undulating drifts and banks of snow. The cars in every driveway are all but obscured, and almost nothing is left uncovered. By the look of the street, 
No fresh treads or tracks. It's unlikely the papers come. So you don't bother to dig in the snow on the porch for it. But there is something sitting by the door. Your heart leaps when you see it. A small forest green gift bag with ribbons for handles. Can it be, you wonder? You grasp the ribbons and bring the bag inside. Bit soon for gifts, isn't it? Comes your grandmother's voice. Who's that from then? You search for the words. You look to her face, smiling and sweet. The face that holds so many generations worth of memories. The rest of the family is gathered in the sitting room, discussing what to do today with all this snow. There's talk of sledding or of staying in to watch movies. You want to tell your grandmother where you were last night, if indeed you were anywhere but the land of sweet dreams. But instead you just say, this is for you, and you hand her the bag. With a curious look in her eye, she reaches in and pulls out the tightly wrapped paper package. She removes the tape, revealing the elegant snow globe within. As she turns it over in her hands, you hear her utter the quietest gasp. She looks to you with tears in her eyes. You return a sheepish smile, then rush into her arms for the kind of hug only a cherished loved one can give. The snow settles softly outside, covering the whole world as far as you can see in silent sweetness. The little house rings with laughter and music, the sharing of memories, and a clink of cups. All the light within is golden, flickering through the sugar pane windows to the outside world. In here, time is suspended, stretched to make space for over-slumbering leisurely breakfasts, hours of mulling spices, and long evenings by the fire. You are safe in your own little gingerbread house, a house of memories. Though the snow will melt, and the family will once again disperse to all corners of the earth, coming back together anew at the same time next year, assuming new shapes and sizes. This moment will carry on, sparkling under glass, forever. <laughs>